broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain. You're listening to the Spartacast League. Tonight, it's just your host, myself, Phelan, and Hims Fox. How you doing there, Hims? Hello. So, this year, already starting out with a huge bang. I am really, really impressed with a lot of the stories that I'm seeing. The United States and the world still just seems to be on fire with expanding class consciousness. What's your take? How are you feeling about this? Well, I mean, it's to the point where I'm going into Walmart and like having casual conversations with people and the checking me out and the checkout line about unionizing. So like people are are getting ready. But I still notice that the majority of the labor power in the United States seems to be concentrated in federal unions. The shutdown was ended by federal aviation directors quitting and threatening to strike and TSA quitting and threatening to strike and then the teachers strike. So it's, it's like skilled labor has all of the, all of the, uh, the weight and might right now. And I really want to see us schmoes, us shelf stalkers, us car drivers getting our, our stuff together. But those jobs are meant to be so precarious and, and unskilled. And, and that is what makes the labor in them so cheap and striking and organizing them so hard. One thing I do want to point out here, though, I really don't like using the term unskilled when describing these jobs simply because I don't believe that there really is a such thing as an unskilled job. Every job requires some sort of skill, even if it is easily trained. Even if you go to some of the most basic jobs out there, you'll notice that they just don't hire just anybody. They are very selective about who they hire, how they hire, you know, whatnot. And the other thing is, is that you could take a CEO and put them inside a McDonald's or a Walmart and tell them, this is what you got to do today. And there's a good chance that they would not be as good as any of those other people on the floor that do this all day. And that's just factual. Right. Okay. So they're not, they're not unskilled. They're uninvested. The CEOs, the bourgeoisie, the 1% or whatever, the corporatists, whatever people are calling them today, because Marxist literature has been crushed and destroyed and, and, uh, uh, oppressed for a century. You know, they didn't, they didn't have to invest in society's schooling that person that you know a teacher has to go and get a master's degree to teach in california that's a large commitment to spending a good decade of your life if not more inside a school the aviation directors you have to have been a pilot before you can be an air traffic controller and so they're jobs that the bourgeoisie hasn't had to invest a lot of capital in uh, well, those jobs are, they've invested a lot of capital, but like the store stalkers, the, the quote, burger flippers, it, the bourgeoisie has not had to invest a lot of labor into, or a lot of capital into developing the labor of that specific individual, which is why it's strikes there are less effective as a teacher strike or an air traffic controller strike. And that's disappointing. That's upsetting to me because that's, You know, an air traffic controller easily makes three digits, which doesn't make them bourgeois at all. Like we have billionaires, but I'm still not seeing the labor actions being carried down to the lowest form of labor. And until that happens, it's not going to be a revolutionary labor movement. It's going to be a reformist labor movement. A labor aristocracy, if you will, uh, what you're saying. Well, isn't that wasn't the term like derived from some the Soviet Union with state capitalist type? Wasn't that wasn't that derived from some like '90s text of and the left was running around with its head cut off trying to figure out what the hell just happened? Uh, no, don't it's, it's, like that word. it's been a thing since early Marxism. 
it's it's been a, uh, a a historical concept. It's not something that people just came up with recently. It's something that you hear about a lot more recently than back in the day because we have a fermented middle class that exists that essentially is a labor aristocracy. We actually do see that today, which is why you hear more talk about it today because it is more applicable than it was say in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s and even the like early part of the 20th century where there really wasn't that big of a middle class built up because really the middle class didn't come to be until after World War II. But in terms of in terms of the shutdown, one of the most telling things about this is is that it wasn't congressional action that got the government started back up. It was the labor unions. The government wasn't able to come to any deal. The Republicans and Trump were not going to budge unless they got their wall until people started saying, well, you know what? We're going to shut down the airlines because we're not getting paid. And all the more power to them because there's no point in going to a job and doing it if you're not going to get paid. That's the entire point of having a job. In a capitalist economy because rent and bills are demanded of you. Like under socialist, you know, in a socialist economy, we should ideally be working at things that we enjoy and the entire concept of, of, of work as this thing you go and spend time at that you hate, it should just be obliterated from society and work should be thought of as something entirely different. But yeah, in a capitalist society that demands blood payment for your life to justify your existence, it surprised me how much of their own bullshit the bourgeoisie seemed to buy. You know, it surprised me just how out of touch the Trump administration and the people con conducting and rooting for the shutdown were. And the fact that they even thought that, oh, you could maybe make a special deal with your landlord because your landlord knows that you're an air traffic controller. Your landlord knows that you, you work for the National Park Service, all that kind of bullshit. You know, they'll, they'll probably float you at the grocery store or whatever. Just the it's amount like of, of bravada, even to the point where one of the White House economic advisors compared the shutdown to a vacation for the workers that were that uh, were f uh, for load, you, you know, the ones that were told just don't show up. Oh, you're you're getting a vacation. They've drank their own Kool Aid. I mean, we we wouldn't be here if they hadn't drank their own Kool Aid. All the posters they put up in in the offices about you should love your job and you will you go to work because you're passionate about blank. I got I hate that question in interviews. You, what are you passionate about? I'm passionate about not starving. And so they've all drank their own Kool-Aid, and so they all exist in outer space, but I'm not necessarily going to give them so much of a pass of just being out of touch because... Because I you're think. you're you're thinking that it's not so much that they're out of touch. This is intentional. This is them trying to normalize it. Is that kind of what you're saying? No, I think the whole idea was to carry it on long enough to drive a wedge in the working class to where there'd be enough sick people, enough people without pay, enough people getting kicked out of their homes, losing their job, that you would get the labor aristocracy and the unions begging for the wall, caving, demanding Trump build the wall. You know, we get, we get it. We're dying. The FDA is not checking food. We're not getting paid. We're getting kicked out of our house. Fine. Build your wall. But there was no way in hell the working class is ever going to do that. Because even if don't with some, even if a worker hasn't read marks when they're put in that situation of, oh, show up to work, by the way, you're not getting paid. They immediately recognize their own power. Well, Especially every, everybody recognized what Trump was doing as well. Every, everybody properly placed blame for the most part on Trump. Even, even the mainstream media understood that what Trump was doing – was essentially extorting the government and using the federal budget as essentially just taking the entire government hostage. Yeah. There was a class element, of course, that never talked about 
you know, what I just said that it was, it was to get the working class screaming for the wall to relieve their suffering. I think he expected it could have, it would have and could have carried on a lot longer because they are out of touch. They don't know that two weeks without a paycheck can be devastating. Yeah, especially with over half of America living paycheck to paycheck, even one missed paycheck for, for some of these people could be dire. And as far as savings go, most people don't even have enough savings for a medical emergency. One medical emergency would mean total bankruptcy for 80% of America. So there's no way that the strike or that, that the shutdown was ever going to continue long enough for the working class to beg and scream for the wall in relief because we are all so shit poor that we're going to strike and we're going to burn stuff down and we will march in the streets before we would do that because we don't care about your goddamn wall. We, we need to go pay a bunch of leeches, a bunch of money for doing nothing but ruining our lives. And really and, what I, I think that this shows here is that organizing works. So that was the one thing that they were afraid of, that they were like, oh, no, we can't have this happen. The reason that I think that the government actually – or Trump ended up caving is because he didn't want the public to see what effect a strike or labor power actually has. He had to end it before it actually reached that point. Because then you would have this huge display of labor power in the United States that would encourage people to go out and start unionizing. And they couldn't have that. So he had to make the concession there. That, that is, that's when it was made. And the timing and everything suggests that because it was less than a day from when the sick outs and the work stoppages were – even called into effect that Trump gets out there and essentially says, we're going to put this out here. Uh, we're going to fund the uh, government for three more weeks, which, by the way, it is temporary. It's it's only for the three weeks so that we'll the government right can. Yeah. And, and then we exactly. We're going to be right back where we are. But this was a move to postpone it. And also, I think that secondly, what he was trying to do as well is he's trying to make himself look reasonable by saying, I'm going to give you more time, but you're going to have to do it. So it will not surprise me if he renegs back when this particular thing expires and the government gets shut down again. So then he gets to run the clock again until – well, the thing is, they already organized over this. This clock's going to be even less. Yeah, so like, they are already organized. They already know what's coming in three weeks. My thought on this is that the unions should not concede. I actually think that it would be uh, a horrendous mistake to do so. Concede as in as in what not not strike, even though the government's now back in operation right they, they they should still go for it in in my opinion simply because well there there, there's there's no budget weeks. passed and that was the whole point of it was to pass a budget even from the, the the politics standpoint of things i don't think that conceding at this point would be effective and also their action showed that labor has power and they, they should use that power well i mean it's going to be used again in three weeks well, those weren't the only strikes that happened just within the U.S. Uh, the teachers in California were striking in Los Angeles, and then there were more strikes in Oakland. And it was pretty much over uh, class sizes in Los Angeles because there are class sizes where teachers are teaching one teacher to 50 students. The, there are schools that don't have school nurses. The superintendent of public instruction for LA School District has never been a teacher, has never sat in a classroom, has never taught anything. I think he's an investment banker. He's an investment banker. And what makes this all the more interesting is he's applying this investment banking strategy to managing his school districts. He actually wants to implement something called the portfolio model, which is a model that's been promoted over numerous schools across the country 
And essentially what it does is it privatizes the schools without actually privatizing them by essentially placing schools, including private schools, into a basket to receive funding. And the schools compete against each other within this basket to receive more funding. And if a school is underperforming, it can be sold out of the basket. Or if it's performing well, another basket Jesus. can buy that school. So it literally God. works. It, it's called the portfolio method. And it literally works the same way that stock portfolios work. That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. You, and you, it, you, it's going to have a bad, quote, bad performing school. And then it's just going to disappear into oblivion. And stop being a school and you're going to have sections of cities that just don't go to school and can't read because they're not, quote, performing, which guess what? Performance is linked to how much money mom and dad have and whether there's food on the table every night and whether your primary concern gets to be homework and not where am I sleeping tonight? Well, I mean, this was done in St. Louis. It was done in, in Detroit. It was done in New Orleans after the uh, the city's all basically collapsed during the recession and, of course, after the hurricane in, in New Orleans. I mean, here in Arizona, you know, that we had not quite this, but, you know, we had on the budget to fund charter schools with public education funds and it got blown out of the sky. It got blown out of the sky via a ballot initiative. And that's just a ridiculous idea using state funds to fund private schools, charter schools. So you're literally just giving a CEO who owns a school who is setting the curriculum could be making a cult about how great he is. Right. And he's getting public money for it. Well, I mean, that's the thing about private schools is they're not answerable to the school board in the same way, even if they operate within the school board, which some private schools and some charter schools do operate within. There is some culpability, but they generally are not held to the same level of accountability as public schools. And so what that really means is, is a lot of these private schools, the vast majority of them are religious schools so that wealthy people or so that very, very religious people within the middle class that can afford it can essentially buy their children a religious and politically indoctrinating schooling. In the case of charter schools, what they're doing is they're taking a lot of that same idea and they're just dumping it into poorer neighborhoods and also giving you subpar education at the same time when it comes to just general charter schools. And I know people that did go to private schools and I can tell you that a lot of their curriculum is some pretty messed up stuff. I had a, a cousin tell me when she went to uh, her private school all the BS that they taught her about the Civil War, for instance. And they told her every white supremacist myth out there about the Civil War. The thing is, you see you, you see this development, especially in Arizona, where the charter schools, they're not religious schools. Actually, funny enough, religious schools aren't as common as you'd think they would be in Arizona. What the charter schools are is they're, they're – business cults they're economic cults they're you know they're political you, indoctrination centers for yeah. right-wing ideology or neoliberal ideology which I, I guess really says the same thing and a lot of times they're also uh free la slave labor farms because what's it there's one in arizona that runs a thrift store and the students have to spend a certain amount of hours, you know, a year working in that thrift store. And it's like a charter school for like problem youth. For right. Problem, and they're just and, learning. And that problem youth just means that they're gay. And so now they're slaves. Essentially what you're saying is it's one of those like conversion therapy schools and they send them to so-called on-the-job training, which is really just we're going to teach you how to run a cash register and stock shelves. Yeah, and not pay you for it. By the way, this, the, they're going to rake in a bunch of money for the school. 
this is different than legitimate on the job training, which would be like a school having a shop class where they taught you how to build something and then sold that or something like that. And the students maybe get a little bit of the profit or the department gets some of that money so that they could spend for better equipment. Like that kind of thing in my mind is, is legitimate. Teaching people apprenticeships, you know. Yeah. Like finding like plumbers or electricians that want to work with. I'm okay with that. And it's important that, that yeah. we do that as leftists too, because like we, we need to know how to run the means of production if we're ever going to take it. But uh, so, you know, even I'm, I'm in no position to get that kind of training through work, but if I can drop a little bit of money on a class for like sewing or whatever, I always jump at that chance because it teaches me how to do something. It teaches me how to use a mean of production. And that's not what you get at these schools. You get slave labor. And now, you know, it wants to be slave labor through public funds. Getting really Roman in here. Yeah. And, you know, it really, really just irks me about this whole teacher strike story is all the think of the children. Oh, they're not going to be in school or whatever because the teachers. So it's such a red herring argument. Because in the long term, what these teachers are doing is actually better for the students. The concession made here by the school district was that they were going to drop the elementary classes to 39 or 35 students per class and middle and high school to 39, which is still really high because that's like what, that's like what it was when I was in high school and that was even too high. When I was in sc- in high school, the largest class was 30 students at, at the school that I went to. And most of the classes were between 15 and 20 students. And, and we weren't even that good of a school. That just kind of goes to show how much education has fallen within the last couple decades because I graduated in 2003. So most of my schooling was in the 90s and – the very early 2000s when it, when I graduated. I mean, I just saw a picture floating around our, our, our meme channels that we all subscribe to of, you know, like the kindergarten, the alphabet, the letters on the wall. And you know how we used to learn it with like zebra and, and carrot is for C, zebra is for Z. Well, it's that except it's companies. It's like E is Exxon Mobil, B is Burger King. It's is this is this real or are you like shitting me? No, this is real. Go look, at, go look at the meme channels. We can post it. We can post it. Uh, a link to like the image. We'll put it on Imgur or something, and we'll we'll put a link in the description of whatever the heck we upload this on. This world is fucking cursed. It just it blows my mind. This is this is what we're at. Dude. This is what neoliberalism has has done to our world. That we live in a world where the the alphabet has been replaced by apple and i I forgot what b was and then carrot and dog it's it's, burger king yeah yeah now it's now b is burger king c is is chevron probably d is coca-cola yo coca-cola oh god it's so gross it really does the the indoctrination has to be so like fully integrated into our lives it has to be in such totality yes, in order to continue to reinforce and try to get, try to trick people into not seeing how utterly stupid it is. Now it's not working for anyone and they see that it's not working for anyone. And the best answer the bourgeoisie has is just, well, let's just indoctrinate harder and privatize more. And what we need, make more we need, cults. What we need is we need the sunglasses. And, and militarize so that, more police. What we need is going to blow up in their face. Well, what we need is we need the sunglasses, right? It's not. You you put the sunglasses on, and instead of seeing seeing B for for Burger King and 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 whatnot, you yeah. see M for murderous cults, because that's what happens when you put the glasses on. Not only are the the strikes like just contained to the the United States here, you know, with our teacher strikes with uh, the the. Uh, with the airline works stoppages, with all of that, India had the largest strike ever. It was a two-day general strike, 
And and ever as in globally, not like ever, ever for India, ever but ever in the, for the history uh, of unless, mankind. Unless he, in in huh? it, ever yeah. in the history of mankind. Unless like wait, okay, can you count can you count the revolution as like the the Russian revolution as a strike? So more people participated in this two day general strike in India than there were people in Russia at the time of the Russian Revolution. There were 200 million people participated in the general strike in India. And most people probably have heard nothing, absolutely nothing about this story. The only recent thing that cropped up in mainstream news for me uh, about India was when a CPI organized that the thousand mile long human chain of women for women's rights over a temple with and in a uh, Hindu problem that I don't understand, but is I'm sure valid and, and has a feminist cause behind it. So, so I saw this through like mainstream news outlets, but they literally photoshopped the party name and all the hammers and sickles off of all the flags and every article. It's just like the audacity to do that. That's got to break some law of journalism, but they don't care. You can't be Western news outlet praising an action of a communist party and let anyone even know that it's remotely a communist party. Yeah, that kind of gave me a little bit of a kick, too, when I when I when I looked at the photos coming out of a few of the news outlets, I actually did notice there are plenty of red flags everywhere like literal like red flags and banners and upon closer inspection i actually found that in several articles they very clearly photoshopped out the hammers and sickles you could see where they were because you could see like the artifacting of it because they didn't use the same color of red that was in the banner it, it I could have done a, a better bit. job. Exactly. I could have done a better job with the blend tool and just smear the red in the white together until there's no more white, and it would have looked better than, than what they did. It was so obvious, and it was just like, God, what what a lie! Like I cannot, I literally can't trust. I can't trust the news to even have a kernel of truth anymore. It's all fake. I mean, not not like fake news in like the the Trump sense, but they just they lie through omission about everything that has an actual impact on your life. So you read this news and you're told of an action of a thing that happened or a person who died or a government that that passed something, but with absolutely no context or bearing of consequence on anyone's life. Well, it's and, it's not it's not so much that they lie about the news or that the news is fake it is that they spin the news that there's yeah. there's always some kernel a truth somewhere within stories and they just take things and they spin it in a direction that leads the audience towards a certain conclusion that the reporting isn't unbiased even if it's not necessarily untrue but like photoshopping out the hammers and sickles from flags when you're reporting on this, like this is your article. It's the centerpiece of it. That is a lie by omission. You are not uh, being forward with the fact you are purposely leaving out the, the very important fact that it was a communist party that organized this. Right. And then the other part is, is that so many of the news articles also omitted why the strikes were occurring or even that they were strikes, like some of them just called them marches. It was very interesting how the reporting went because it was really hard to find out why they were doing what they were doing. And the whole reason that they were having these protests is because the current prime minister of India, Modi, who is part of the BJP, which is a far conservative Hindu nationalist party, within India has begun massive anti-labor and privatization efforts within India where they're taking these these companies that are, are publicly owned and are, are public resources 
and are doling them out to the to the private sector that are they're, they're selling them back it's causing huge problems within the the indian economy think about the effects of privatization in the united states which you know all goods flow into the united states the center of empire imagine what a reduction in worker protections and worker quality of life would look like in india yeah because it affects so many more people like india has 1.3 billion people which actually kind of shows you the entire scale of how big this protest was that over 200 million people, it's not quite, but it's it's almost one fifth of the country. Yeah. Comparably, this would be like if 40 million people in the United States got up and participated in a giant strike. That that would how which that would could be, be happening in three weeks. Yeah, which <laughs> could be. Well, I, I don't wish. know, like like the entire country per se, but but also just w- when you talk about these populations too, when you say 1.3 billion people, India does not have 1.3 billion workers. They have 1.3 billion people. Effectively, probably about half of that is actually like workers. Just like about half, it's a it's a little bit more. I think I think like United States has three hundred and thirty million what people. About the one percent and the ninety nine percent. So so we have three hundred and thirty million people, or three hundred and forty million, whatever it is right now, and about two hundred million are actually like like working because the rest are either retired, they're children, they're unemployed, etc. When you when you take out forty million of two hundred or uh, 200 million out of 500 or 600 million, you kind of see where this leads, like like how much of the working class is actually getting up and doing something. And that's impressive because that means we're talking not just double digits, we're talking fractions of it, like large major chunks. And so, you know, the march is on. There's no doubt anymore that there is a resurgent global left, but we need to we need to do a lot better with internationalism because well of course the United States is getting its butt kicked there in Mexico also there's seventy thousand workers mostly auto workers but it just sort of snowballed into most people affected by NAFTA and they're all on strike and they're going to the US border to call for solidarity with the workers in the United States and it sucks that we only have one large city on the border and that's that would be San Diego cuz otherwise they're going to be yelling at small towns El Paso um, El Paso has over half a million people uh, El Paso's big it's yeah. El Paso and uh San Diego and Yuma but, but I looked on the map where this town is, I think. It's like in the, the south, very southern tip of Texas, on the other side of the border of Texas on the coast. Oh, it's it's near Brownsville. Yeah, that's actually a pretty big town. Brownsville, Laredo, like those places aren't – they're not huge cities, but they're big. This is starting to happen now every two or three weeks instead of like every two or three months. It definitely is accelerating. And then we still have the issues in France that are still going on and have escalated that more people in the beginning of January were participating in the the riots and the strikes there than were participating at the end of December and middle of December. Wow. And so it's growing. Yeah. So it's it's growing and it's growing r- really fast and it's getting to the point where in France the government has actually taken extreme measures to try to put down the yellow vest movement including uh there's a there's a story out there where they shot a a fireman in the head with uh one of those uh, tear gas grenades right in the head and knocked him out he was out cold. He went to the hospital uh, because it put him into a coma. There were reports of uh, the police in France assaulting people with automatic weapons, which, by the way, this story did come out of Breitbart originally. So I'm kind of skeptical on the source and why it was coming out. 
But I, I have a feeling that this was in part also kind of glorifying this because it seems like a section of the right within France has started to denounce the Yellow Vest movement because they couldn't fully control it. So Yeah, Marie Le Pen yeah. told them to go home, that they're being too rowdy, and shot her, herself in the foot by saying that. But yeah, they can't control it. It's not theirs. It's taken on too much of a left-wing critique, and so they do just want it killed. Yeah, all the, they, uh, the graffiti of hammers and sickles and guillotines. <laughs> but yeah, the actual numbers on the participants was... 32,000 on December 29th was reported and over 50,000 as of January 6th, which Jeez. even though those are those are older numbers now that we're getting towards the end of the month, the, the movement's still going on pretty strong as of right now. The responses to it are, like we said, becoming more and more dire. We're, we're starting to see them really start to crack down on it. We're starting to see the, the right try to abandon it because it is starting to take a more left-wing characteristic, which honestly, I have to say here, I told you guys so. I told you so. <laughs> you Everybody sat there and shat on this movement because, oh, there's too many right-wing people out there. We'll, we'll never be able to co-opt it or, or whatever. It's it's character. It's, it's labor aristocracy. What, whatever excuse they had, they threw at it. And people were just really heavily discounting this movement. And I still see this within the mainstream media. They still call it like an anti-environmentalist protest. It's so far off of what it actually is. It's intellectually dishonest to call it that. Yeah, I had to do a whole bunch of damage control inside of like climate change and like climate rebellion or whatever, like subreddits, because all the really liberal people started yelling at the you know yelling about the poor french people and how they're ruining everything and and you know they're being anti-environmentalist and what are the people in suburbia that are making these yeah. posts more than likely because i can guarantee you they they probably are suburban white liberals what well, are like, what are what are they going to do when we have a crisis in the United States and they can't fill up their vehicles because gas costs six or seven dollars a gallon and they can't get to work. I'm very glad because I don't see this anymore. And I think that enough leftists got onto those subreddits and screamed and yelled at them because I haven't seen the, those kind of posts in a long time because I think there was a realization on the environmentalism movement that the reason why environmentalism hasn't gotten anything done is because it decided to align itself with the bourgeoisie, tell people to go buy expensive light bulbs and, and then yell at them if they didn't go buy expensive light bulbs that were $10 that they didn't chose to, you know, feed their kid instead. That was the. Right. The and I didn't see anybody going out made. of their way to volunteer to buy some poor people, some light bulbs. So. Until yeah. until the people are willing to walk the walk and say, "Hey, you know what? There's people out there that can't afford this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna help them afford this." That wasn't going on. They were just outright chastising poor people. Yeah, and and, and what did that do? That gave a huge opening for the right to come in and and tell the poor people, you know, you know, those are environmentalists. They just want to take everything away from you. That one last little thing that we let you have that few hours at work or whatever, your game or whatever, they want to take that away and make you sit in the dark and all the kind of, you know, weird crap that they come up with. They'd allowed the environmentalist movement to be made into the enemy of poor people. And they, they, they largely did themselves. And that's why environmentalism became associated with the coastal liberal elite or whatever that is supposed to mean. People who could afford expensive light bulbs. And I'm so glad to see the switch in that with Extinction Rebellion, even though they're not really rebelling. They're just marching with science. They need to do some actual rebelling. Otherwise, they're it's, it's performative and useless. But like, I, I think that they need to call as, as much as they can a general strike. They need to have people out there for climate saying, yeah. no, uh, the current status quo is unworkable 
and unmaintainable and is going to kill us all. And we refuse to go down this path and we're going to stop the gears of capitalism until something is done. Like there is the the Earth Strike, which the two movements are so closely relate working together and related. Now there might as well be one thing. And their whole strategy is to build this up in small parts throughout the year, so that people know about it, hear about it, and then actually do a general strike. Because you call a general strike, and it's like it's just going to fall flat on its face. Like there were several general strikes called in like the very first months of Trump's presidency in 2017. That just fell flat on flat on its face because like no one heard about them, and no because as poor people's time is entirely commodified or entirely taken up by work or entirely taken up by getting keeping oneself at just a barely functioning level to be able to get out of bed and keep going to work. So they don't know what what is the stuff is. But when you get like Extinction Rebellion stuff in the streets yelling about corporations, well. Poor people know it's corporations screwing them over. It's always corporations screwing them over. It's always a, a dick in a suit. And so they hear that and latch on to that. So I think this is a, it's a very positive switch for environmentalism to have made to stop yelling at poor people. And also to ram forklifts into the finance ministry in France. That's also a very good action. They should do more of that. I mean, that, that was an Extinction Rebellion who did that. It was just a yellow vest guy. But he, the, more, more, more stuff like that. Let's, let's, get, let's get that happening, but for climate change. So in other words, you're saying maybe we should build like, oh, God, this guy was kind of shitty, but like I'm going to go for it. So you're saying that we should build our own kill dosers for the environment. We will build potato artillery. And 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 the shelling of the finance ministries <laughs> with with spuds shall not stop. We'll go we'll go real real anarcho primitive on them. The spud bud rebellion. Spud bud rebellion. And and you know they, they just keep chugging along. You know people are setting fire to the streets. You know fifth of India goes on strike, and the plan is still to. F- you know, for AT and T to well, fire seven thousand people, that they pitched the tax breaks as being good because it would allow them to save seven thousand jobs. They got the tax breaks. They're nixing those seven thousand jobs. So no, uh, they did not say that they would be able to keep seven thousand jobs. They said that they were going to add seven thousand jobs. That they would oh, be able to bring okay. hardworking, high-paying AT and T jobs. And then after this happened and they they went and they they fired all these people, the CEO said, I actually didn't say that. What I said was, is that it would have the effect on the economy of providing 7,000 jobs for every billion (laughs) that we save through taxes because that money trickles down. It flows down, man. The invisible hand of the market. So we'll essentially, slap you upside the face. Essentially, he just tra- he he lied about what he said. So, are they unionizing over it? AT and T, in part, has uh, unionized departments. Oh, they're probably yeah. co-opted as all hell. Uh, no, they're actually ran through the CWA, which is actually one of the better unions out there. Oh, okay. And if yeah, you that's ha- decent. Yeah, and if you have an opportunity... It's if, kind of social democratic. Yeah. If, if you have an opportunity to join any corporate union out there, I'd say join the CWA. They're uh, a, a good, decent union. And it's not like you can't double card. You can double card with, with the IWW, with any union. It's illegal for them to tell you you can't, by the way. So if they ever do tell you you can't, double card. I keep that in mind that yes, you can in fact join the IWW and also be a part of the Teamsters, for instance. AT&T does this. Uh, Verizon gets caught uh, spreading anti-union propaganda uh, to their managers so that they can pressure their store employees to not unionize by essentially just lying to them about unions and saying that the the most basic lies that they will tell you about unions, which is they don't necessarily give you what you want. It's it's negotiations and there's always compromise that 
you're free to if you have a problem you can go to your boss we have an open door policy it's the same bullshit that you hear over and over again from every single one of these companies and it's the same if bullshit your boss that- assaulted you don't worry you can go talk to your boss about it it's an open door policy yeah and then i've i've worked at these places that are open door policies and essentially the door is open as long as it's convenient for them and also they like to do the the chain thing so like you said if it's your boss that's the problem then if you go to your boss's boss do you know what they do did you go to your boss about this no because my boss is the problem and they're like well maybe you need to bring it up with your boss first and i actually literally when i i worked at the uh, the credit union there was a situation where at one of these like big company galas that they host for the employees where they essentially like have dinner at a hotel for everybody. The CEO gets up there and he speaks and then he has people ask questions. At the last gala that they held, uh, he did the whole trick where he was like, did you speak to your boss about this issue? And somebody said, well, no, because it's not really something I could speak to my boss about because it's not something that they would know. And he told them effectively to sit down and shut up, but not in those words. He just told them, sit down. You need to ask your boss first then. God, and says, literally yeah, just kicking around. And literally 10 other people got up and asked them the same question. Like, why not? Jesus. What, you know, like, because everybody knew that at that point, the entire dinner was a farce. Jeez. Okay, so the anti-union propaganda, though, is so hard played that at the Verizon facility, um, that or what Verizon was actually doing was they actually tried to use one of their, uh, their, their stores in Brooklyn as an example of unions like damaging the company and stuff like that. And interestingly enough, they really couldn't find – anything there it was mostly just complaints about the fact that they had to deal with the union demands their entire argument against it was that unions work because they had to act on union demands so wait so did this store did they essentially let this store in boston unionize as like a controlled experiment or was this store in boston just already unionized? No, uh, brooklyn like, and uh oh, they on, they sorry. they voted to unionize and so the company tried to use it to say that the store was dysfunctional and that's why they unionized, et cetera. They tried to have it be part of this propaganda campaign to set an example and it just kind of fell flat. Like I said, they drink their own Kool-Aid. They used to at least know that they were lying to us. Now they believe their own bullshit. In addition to all the, all these strikes here, because we got India, we got France, we we have Mexico. And the one that If you live in the United States, it's right next door and you probably didn't even hear about it. People shut down Canada for an entire day. There there was a huge work slowdown and stoppage in Canada uh, that consisted of hundreds of thousands of people. And it was actually over native rights, impressively enough. Damn. That hashtag shutdown Canada was a major thing that was going on in solidarity with the Unistoten camp, uh, which is a camp that's located on Wet'suwet'en territory. And what the Wet'suwet'en are is that they are a native first people that live on unceded territory in British Columbia. So essentially their tribe does not recognize the authority of the Canadian government within their territory. This is actually an arrangement that they do have with the Canadian government, that the Canadian government is supposed to honor and respect this. And as per international law, Canada is required to ask for permission to entry into this territory, etc. They have every right is any other sovereign nation. What essentially happened is a couple weeks ago, around, I believe it was uh, mid-January, just after, uh, I think January 15th or so, the RCMP launched raids against the Wet'suwet'en territory on behalf of a company that was trying to put in a pipeline on their territory without their permission. 
And essentially what they were doing was, is they said that the, uh, the First Nations organization there, uh, their, their national organization said that all the, uh, the neighboring tribes, you know, like went with it and the elected tribes, but not the hereditary uh, chiefs voted in favor of the gas company. But it's the hereditary chiefs in this particular case that matter as per international law. Because they're the recognized authority within this particular territory. Essentially, the the elected positions and like even like the First uh, Nations organization that exists within Canada, that was actually all set up as a means to kind of contain the First Nations into a legal structure so that they have to abide by a Canadian imperialist mandates. So they were or were not successful in fending off the the invasion. So I mean, it, it, looks, invasion. it looks like they really weren't uh, successful in doing it, that the RCMP did actually go to the uh, to the camp. They tore down the checkpoint that was there that the natives had created to blockade the oil company or gas company. Uh, from entering the territory, and they did so in a very violent manner. They they literally the RCMP got on the bridge and attacked mostly women protesters. There are fourteen people that were arrested at the gate, and they essentially the RCMP walked over to the bridge and just started pulling people out of the uh, the blockade. And just shoving them down and arresting them. Well, didn't it happen the as Trudeau, or at least like the day of, or the day before Trudeau, was literally attending this feel-good, self-congratulatory panel about Native rights and history and how good Canada has been to their Natives? Yeah, and, and that, that's Meanwhile, the, they're, being, they're invading them. That's the whole ironic point about all of this, right? Is that... While this was all going on, right before this kicked off, Trudeau was sitting there slapping himself about how great Canada is towards its native peoples, even though it has an atrocious record towards the first peoples of Canada. Pretty much everything that happened in the United States happened also in Canada. The first prime minister of Canada was a huge he, he was essentially just a war criminal. They committed numerous crimes against humanity, against native people there, and was celebrated because of it. And also, ironically, this happened around the same day, because I believe January 15th, or maybe it's the 11th, is the national holiday that honors the first prime minister of Canada. But the reason that the RCMP raided this, this camp is because they knew that this encampment was vulnerable because the entire camp was in mourning and was having funeral ceremonies for a tribal elder who had recently passed. It really does show the, the cold and calculated brutality that the Canadian government has towards executing these operations against native peoples and against its its own people because there were Canadian citizens there that were helping. And this wasn't some small operation either. They literally sent out their most elite anti-terrorist convoy and executed this with military precision. This was, for all intents and purposes, a military operation against their own people. And they're doing this against people that just want to be left alone, that all these people want is they want to be able to be left alone. They want to protect their land. They want to protect their water. They don't want these companies coming in and pushing them off of their land. They're, they're tired of all the, the surrounding cities annexing their territory and pushing them out because as far as the Wet'suwet'en go, they have been pushed around in their own territory for years, the surrounding cities have essentially, between them and other companies, have annexed 90% of their territory. This particular camp is pretty much one of the only places within their land that they can 
go about freely and live their lives. And if it's gone, then, I mean, that is a, what's the term? Not genocide. Well, it, it is. It's a, it's a cultural genocide. They're not killing the people. They're killing the gens. They're killing the nation in this particular instance. They're killing the culture yeah. that is there. So, yeah, it, it is genocide in the fact that they are forcing the assimilation to kill the people there, the, the culture of it. Their territory is really far north, isn't it? So it it's, is. It's, 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 it's just it's, for this oil pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 are really desperate to get this. Uh, it's it's a gas pipeline, but yeah, they're they're really desperate to get it in because they want to extract every ounce of gas they can from from Canada, and the Canadians really aren't better off for it. Yeah, maybe temporarily, but in in terms of the environment and the long term effects, and a lot of people don't know this, but especially with the the Amazon in crisis because the Amazon used to produce about 80% of the world's oxygen at one point still produces a significant amount. Uh, rainforests are very important, but there's another vast expanse of forest. It's called the Northern Forest or the Taiga, and it's all over Siberia and it's all over Canada, and it's these big evergreen forests that are miles in expanse. And these forests are so important to Earth's ecosystems that they are almost as important as the taiga, or as the rainforest. And in terms of replenishing oxygen in, in a world where the rainforests are being cut down at rapid pace, it is important that these lands be preserved. And that's what these people are doing. They are protecting their lands and preserving them, not just so that they can live uh, traditionally. But so that everybody can, can live because once these are gone, once the rainforests are gone, there's not going to be a lot left for the environment to heal itself. They, they are an integral part of the ecosystem. Yeah, we're, we're going to suffocate ourselves for fidget spinners and useless crap like that. The thing that holds us up possibly prevents that future are – the very same people whose land you and me are both sitting on, never having to have asked to be on it, just showing up is having ancestors with the same color skin as us show up here one day, kill a bunch of them and say, this is our land. Now I wake up, I think about that a lot. I wake up and I look outside and I look out at the desert and I go, none of this is mine. And why am I here? What am I doing? Yeah, here? well, and, and I'm if certainly you, if you not. Really, if you really think about enjoying it, enjoying any of it, is this is this what that the genocide was for? This was not is not worth it. We we had one big genocide for this, and if you expand out the timeline, it's really what's coming down the line is 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 just more death and destruction because the system can't maintain itself, and the the next big genocide will probably be calling off the poor. That That's where it's going. It's the only place that it can go. And so you're, you're right. It's just it, – and it's not like we could just go back to Europe. That would be yeah. – it's impossible. And, so and there's, no, there's no plan. Like I've talked – I've never talked to a native person who has said, yeah, our plan is to just full deportation of white people. It was never even their plan when we first settled here. Like they viewed us as equal as equals and that we came here to settle this land and that it would be shared. And that is a theme. Like I'm not generalizing Native American peoples. It is it is a common theme throughout most of their cultures that sharing is important. And and it was never seen as you know, you know, competition was not something that was highly valued as, as valued as cooperation was. I mean, yeah, these were civilizations. Sometimes they went to war with each other. Sometimes they fought, but none of them ever owned the land. None of them ever traded the land. And when the English 
first landed colonies, not the Spanish. They hated the Spanish. Spanish just came and killed everyone. But when actual colonies showed up, it was like the, the plan was never from the beginning to run these people off. It was always, even as the Spanish were murdering their way up Florida, Native American peoples were meeting them and trying to do peace offerings and trying to do political no negotiations and trying to forge alliances and saying, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do the just slaughter always every time met with slaughter. I don't think it's in the cards. I mean, that's something well, that, like, Nazis are scared of is that well, we're all going to get kicked off the continent and that's not going to happen. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, is like if you if you kind of look at history and stuff like that, you kind of get an idea of like what could happen. Uh, it's just it's hard to put it into modern context because so much of history, of course, is within its own time. Even if you look at like the Seminole Nation, for instance, in in Florida, that was an unconquered nation. They they had three wars with the United States government that were guerrilla wars until they they were finally half of them were essentially cast to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. These people fought long and hard, and a lot of people don't don't know this about the Seminoles, but they weren't just Native Americans. They were white people who were tired of the colonial culture. They were escaped slaves, a lot of them. And these people all lived together to create essentially a post-colonial society in Florida and became the Seminole Nation. So the idea that we can't have some sort of synthesis with uh, Native Americans that, that we can't coexist is is fallacious. Well, uh, well there, we're going to have to because it's yeah. the, you know they're the only cultures left on Earth that value the land and value cooperation. That's because they understand that they know that the land is sacred. That it's life. It's it's what. It's what gives them their culture, that the land and the resources are important and should be protected and should be preserved so that other people in the future have those same opportunities to life and happiness that they have. And that's the attitude that they have, yeah. they've, they've taken and they, they understand that. that's why they – revere the you know like the water on their land that's that's why you you keep seeing the water rights uh like not just the Wet'suwet'en but uh the uh the Dakota pipeline as well similar situation there where it was water became an issue because if you don't have water you don't have a society because people need water and it's it's that simple and th these native peoples understand this and they understand that if you don't have these basic things nobody absolutely nobody is going to have a civilization they won't and eventually yeah. we won't because the conquerors will destroy it all yeah on um, for for a few hundred years of of profit because that's all that they can see and you, you know you're right i mean the only place it can go is is just a genocide of of the poor then you have to to ask yourself, I mean, really, is that the legacy that we want humanity to have in the end? Yeah, is this, that's how it is ended. This, yeah, exactly. Is this, this how it ended? Is the entire purpose, if you will, the entire buildup of humanity, was it all just to extinct the species so that a few people could enjoy obscene wealth for – 100 200 years and then everything just all die and collapse yeah because that, that's what's going to happen in the end and the wealthy aren't going to survive it no i mean they think they're going to go to their bunker but she will get them before they get there what do you think they they do the, like their the private security company is going to guard their bunker uh, like do they think that wage labor is going to still be a thing people are going to be what are they going to come out to Nothing. Yeah. Like, the, congratulations, you are the king of a hill of ash. The, the, the entire world is burned and it's all their fault. These issues are important because they provide an alternate path for society to go down, just like Marxism and socialism 
provides an alternative path for people to go down. And it's important that we listen to these views and we integrate these views in and we decolonize our cultures because our cultures will be better for it and that we as a people will be better for it. And we as a people will be more resilient for it, that this is the key. And if we destroy this, if if society keeps going down the self-destructive route, there won't be anything left for anybody, including the bourgeoisie. They are on a path towards absolute suicide and extinction of the species. Unless they blast off to Mars and then and then all sorts of weird crap's gonna happen where they're gonna start doing eugenics to pick the the ones on Earth worthy of having a good breeding stock to restart the perfect Aryan race on Mars. But can they really extend it forever? Or is revolution going to be inevitable no matter what they do, no matter what they try? And yeah, no no matter what they do, no matter what they try, it's it's I mean, they'll they'll either still make the same mistake on Mars and destroy that planet or they'll kill off their colony somehow because most of the the early colonies that were killed in the U.S. were died off because they were being ran by essentially corporations that didn't care about its inhabitants. They weren't cities or societies. They were just uh, they were companies, marks. yeah, that were existed to extract lumber or a fine gold or, or whatever it is that they were looking for uh, in in America. And these particular early colonies all just kind of fell flat on their faces. But you know, there's still idiots out there who think that we're the cause of it with feminism. And whatever their bad memes have told them, and they've decided that they're going to spend their important hours of their important days of their important years left to go and show up and intimidate a DSA meeting at gunpoint and then spray paint graffiti all over an IWW building. Oh it, yeah, it, in Portland, right? In really like, it really lame too. Like, you just spray paint on Antifa House. Like, okay, the people drive by and see that. Are they supposed to like already think Antifa's bad because you think Antifa's bad and everyone thinks like you, Joey Gibson? I think they were more going for like, uh, like the Animal House reference, like Antifa House. Yeah, but they don't have a, these people don't have a sense of humor. Yeah, that's right. They they don't really. Uh, so essentially what happened was the usual suspects uh, of Patriot Prayer. So it was Joey Gibson, Tiny Toes and uh, freaking Haley Adams all showed up armed at a DSA meeting and started just intimidating people, started intimidating people uh, with weapons Everybody essentially just kind of dispersed because, you know, what, what are you going to do when somebody shows up with weapons? Well, there should have been someone at the DSA meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So Fuck you, the SRA, where, where are you? Exactly. What makes it interesting is the next day, the Patriot Prayer Group went back to the IWW Hall because that's where the DSA was meeting, which is this house in Portland. And they marched in front of it. And they were essentially assaulting and accosting anybody that walked by. And this is on video. So there, there is video all over Twitter. This, it's very easy to find. It was one of the people, and they actually were with the, uh, the DSA. And they, they walked by because they had heard it had happened. And apparently the group recognized the person that was filming them and the Patriot Pair group walked across the street and then tried to beat the guy up in a mob. And the guy actually had to hide out in like a pet store. Jesus. So these people just unprovoked. And then afterwards, they were marching up and down the street, just trying to find people to beat up. God. So Damn. you literally have people acting like literal brown shirts going around beating people up intimidating people, assaulting them, threatening them, what have you, on the streets of Portland. And the cops did nothing, by the of way. Like, like the, 
The guy actually did call the cops and the cops never showed up. Of course. Because of <laughs> course. Of course they're not they're no, not gonna show up. They're not gonna do over. anything about it. It's it's already well documented that Portland police sympathize more with Patriot Prayer than they do the locals there that are protesting against what Patriot Prayer is doing. Most of Patriot Prayer comes out of the area. They drive in from usually Vancouver, Washington, which is about 15 minutes, half an hour away from Portland. A lot of these people live in the countryside outside of Portland. They drive in. They cause all this ruckus and the locals protest them. They want them out and the police do nothing. And, you know, that means that it means that these communities have to defend themselves. But then, like after this whole thing happened, about two days later is when the IWW Hall was actually vandalized. So they went back again a third time and they spray painted Antifa House and then smashed communism all over the house. And by the way, they they misspelled communism because they had to insert another M in there. Like you you could see it looks like the second M was an afterthought. (laughs) Great spellers. But honestly, I say keep up, keep keep the Antifa house tag up there. That's kind of cool. I like that. I could go for that. The entire situation surrounding the Portland DSA and Portland IWW, which is Pretty nearby where I live, actually. I don't live in Portland, but I live close to Portland enough that this is kind of concerning for me and my safety as well uh, at this point. I do think that we need community defense to deal with this kind of threat and to ensure that we have sufficient protection at our meetings. So, yeah, I think the, the idea of having the SRA armed Showing up at a DSA meeting to protect the proceedings, same thing with the IWW, have the SRA there as a presence to keep off people like Patriot Prayer. I think that that is becoming increasingly necessary. And also, I think it would send the message to people like Patriot Prayer groups who make the assumption that we aren't armed and that we are easy and soft targets that it's not going to be shooting fish in a barrel because that's part of the reason that they did this. They did it because they knew that it would be a soft target. And we should assume if they do come back next time, they are going back for the purpose of hurting people because that's exactly what they said they were going to do. Hims? You know, we we really need to start cooperating among the little cadres that we have built Uh, because what the left has essentially done at this point is it has created portions of itself that have specialized in something. The IWW specializes in forming labor unions. The DSA specializes in the electoral stuff and SRA specializes in guns and the Antifa specializes in intelligence. So like we, we've got all of the ingredients here of a, a working cooperating organ that doesn't even have to be like the Marxist Leninist line of a party, but we really need to start knowing each other and going to each other's meetings and federating with each other at the very least, because we we've each specialized into a skill set that alone is might make a little dent, but together all wielded towards. So, each so other's in other goals. words, you're talking about synthesis. Yes, we should work together because synthesis. we're more than the sum of our parts. I haven't uh, heard well, that word since the 90s. Yeah. Well, today there's a different word they like to use, and I hate that word, and I refuse to say it. And let's just say, as one of my former bosses said, because he didn't actually know what the word meant and liked to use it, it's energy, but with an S. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's the show ender right there. No. The show's got so much energy, but with an S. So much energy, but with an S. But I do want to go back here, though, just for, for a second here, that we we do need more federation on the left. You're absolutely right. We need more integration. Like I said, SRA showing up 
at places so that they're no longer targets. Maybe we do need something like the Austin Red Guards that shows up armed, ready to go if needed in case something well, does happen and does look just a little bit intimidating because you have to admit if you have that if you have that look there they're not going to mess with you they're not they're well, not going to come out because they see that there's some guys out there with some scary looking guns and i know that that may throw off some liberals out there but really we're not catering towards the liberals per se yeah. but the other thing is is most people will understand hey there's some bad guys out there that have threatened to attack us and this is the step necessary to protect our own people to protect our community because the thing is is that these people don't just go after leftists they go after anybody tangentially even related to them. They go after anything they think is leftist and what they think is leftist are liberals sometimes. Some of these people literally think that Hillary Clinton is a communist. Some of these people think that liberal soccer moms are advocating literal communism. So that's and that's they're how not advocating social democracy. Yeah, either. that's they're still yelling at Bernie. Exactly. That's how that's how indoctrinated these people are. And for these people to go around with guns saying that they're going to beat up some communists, what does that really mean? What are they really saying when they've already defined communism as pretty much anything that even looks a little bit left of Adolf Hitler? What does that tell you? And so it does become a duty and responsibility that, that we have to protect not only our own, but also those people that aren't involved, that don't necessarily even want to be involved, that maybe are liberals or whatever, because they certainly don't deserve to be shot down by some right winger because somebody made the wrong assumption about their politics. And and for the left to do this, it's going to require some getting over of sectarianism. It, it definitely, it will. It will require that we get over a lot of the personality problems that we have between people. That's another big issue on the left is that, oh, I heard person A is in group B and now I don't want to be part of group B because I don't like person A. Well, you know what? Right. Get over yourself. I work with a lot of people that – I'm. I'm not gonna say I don't like them. Um. I. I'd say that like I. 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 I would call them acquaintances. Thanks, but not, I would call them acquaintances, but not friends. You know. Thanks. And I. I love you, hymns, <laughs> but not in that manner. So, so don't think it like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know you're not talking about me. But there's a lot of people out there that. I disagree with. And then there's a lot of people I disagree with and I still am friends with. But you don't yeah. have to be friends with somebody to work with them. You don't start by building an ideologically pure party and then and then going with your five people or whatever. Right. And that's not how working class movements gain traction to begin with. That if you mire yourself into sectarianism, then you're not going to get anywhere. We have to be willing to work together with yeah. each other, with people like that we disagree at, with. At, at my – the organization that I've pretty much chosen, uh, which is people who ad, – ad, admittedly, they don't like the DSA because the DSA here stitched all of their actual working class unionizing community service stuff and just did a bunch of canvassing for politicians. And we all felt like, well, gee, if we're going to do this, we might as well just go join the Democrats. And so we formed our, they formed their own thing and I joined and we don't talk about theory. We don't talk about books. We talk about what we're doing. We talk about the community garden that we run. We talk about the homeless program, help program that we're setting up. We talk about the charity that helps um, right. and, and the furnish whole, their houses. And the whole reason that you do that is because talking about in-depth theory at that level doesn't really apply to those things things at least not yet because your movement isn't 
at the point where those things are applicable right now. What's important is that that garden grows successfully uh, or that you can get food to homeless people. That's the important thing right now. And it's mission focused. And that's the kind of stuff that we need right now. Yeah, I couldn't care less to ever have another argument with the USSR again. Oh, come on. You you know you want one more round of defending Stalin. Just one. Uh, I'm kidding. Fine. I'm kidding. But for real. Like but Yeah, yeah. Like, well, that's that's my thing. It's like it's a useless waste of time. Like like people you don't have anything anymore. Well, well, people that know me know that like I I'm not too particularly fond of anarchism. I I think it's a, I think it's utopian and People are welcome to disagree with me. I, in fact, I, I welcome it. The fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, I don't care if somebody agrees or not with me because that's not the point. The point is, yeah. is that the end goal of what I want and the end goal of what anarchists want, the, the end goal of what most leftists want is largely all the same, that we all want a stateless, classless society, or at least a classless society. We want something more equitable than what we have. We we don't want people starving in the streets anymore. We don't want people uh, being exploited on end until they die so that some guy can, you know, m- make lifetime over lifetime's worth of profit. And and we have we have a remarkable gift right now that we shouldn't squander on the left in that for the first time in a century, leftists are able to organize and get things done without any worry about where they, about what they think of the Soviet Union. Because all throughout the 20th century, if you were a leftist party, your first question that you were, you had to answer was, where do you orient yourself in terms of the Soviet Union? Are you pro-Soviet Union? Are you anti-Soviet Union? Are you are you non-aligned? Uh, right. And you and, and have it's... that problem that that kept organizing from happening. That, that well, you, you can you disagree know... all day about the Soviet Union and it has no yeah, impact I... on on reality and what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And interestingly enough. It is kind of a two-pronged problem, right? Like, so when the Soviet Union fell, capitalism went balls to the wall. They pulled out all the stops and everything has gotten much worse because before there was this boogeyman out there that kept capitalism halfway reasonable and there was this like American dream and promise that had to be kept. And now that that doesn't exist, of course, capitalism has went balls to the wall, like I said, and – pulled out all the stops and and all those promises that were made are, are no longer kept. It's, it's, but at the same time, we don't have to apologize on behalf of the Soviet Union for things that are worth criticizing for, that, that we can take yeah. a critical look at what went wrong. And I think both of those things are important. I don't think that everything the Soviet Union or everything that Red China did is perfect. And I say this as a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist. And also, I don't think that everything that they did was per se wrong. And I, I think that that's, that's part of what critical analysis is. It's not wholesale condemning something, but it's not wholesale condoning something either. You can do both. And people should do both. They should study things and they should form an opinion. But also, like you said, those things are dead now. Ultimately, yeah. one's opinion on the Soviet Union, to me, doesn't matter as much as their larger goals, their their, their larger opinions, what they're trying Especially to get their actions. done. Yeah, they're, they're trying to get done and their actions and their actions do matter. And, and those are even more important, in my opinion, than the words that they say. What kind of actions are they doing to further develop communism or further develop anarchism? What are they doing? And And that should be the goal. That should be the core question of every leftist organization, federation of organizations that we need to form and will be forming because it's natural that this would be forming. 
that these groups are going to link up and 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 commit energy to each other and action to each other eventually right. but, and that and needs to be the guiding principle of it is is what are we doing to further not what do we think not what are the label of our ideology is not what book we've read or not read but what are we doing what are we doing and how does this forward the movement that's two questions that are highly important and like i said earlier in terms of the issue with the with patriot prayer showing up i only expect this problem to get worse this situation has emboldened people on the right. If you are a member of the DSA, if you are a member of the IWW, you need to realize that, yes, you could be targeted. Your meetings could be targeted and you need to be prepared for that. The IWW needs to prepare for it. The DSA needs to prepare for it. These discussions are important. Community defense is at the forefront of much of what leftism is about in the first place. If you really do think about it, the actions of striking is a form of community defense. You are defending yourself and your community against an employer, against a business executive that is exploiting you and exploiting your community for profit. And that's important to understand. So much of everything else that we do on the left is integral to community defense. So this is one more thing that we just have to think about. And I think that things like the SRA are going to become more and more integral as we find the need to physically defend ourselves because these groups are violent and these people – are willing to do these kind of things, sadly enough. And thankfully, they're also usually really stupid. <laughs> well, thankfully, but here's the thing. Even if they are, we still got to be prepared for it. We still yeah, got yeah. to, like, you, you don't have to have a lot of intelligence to hurt a lot of people. No, you don't. So you don't. regardless of what their level of intelligence is, it's, it's, it's a non-issue. It's neither here nor there. For us to make those assumptions that they're all idiots, that they don't know what they're doing, is foolish on our part. And tactically, it doesn't make any sense to, to do so. Well, I, I think that community service is the best way. Of all the leftist groups I've joined, I think that community service is the thing that I've seen get it off the ground the most. But clubs never get it off the ground. Electoral stuff. Do you, do you just lose people to the Democratic Party because they're bigger, more organized, and have more ability and more stuff to do? Well, you um, know why community service actually works is because community service shows the people within your community that you're doing more than mm -hmm. just the the political stuff. That you're yeah. you're out there walking the walk. That. You're providing food. Maybe you show up to, you know, provide some protection for some people. That's that's like the whole thing, like with the original Red Guards, like serve the people. If you're a leftist listening to this today, as we sign off here and and say good night, think about whatever group you're in, whatever organization you're in, and think about what community action, what food kitchen, what garden, what nonprofit volunteer work you can do you can add to the roster of things that you're already doing to really get your branch engaged right yeah so bring your branch but also like i i do think that we do need something integral like a red guard to forward that as well where the people in there and i know like anarchists are going to hate this but they're uniformed so they're <laughs> visible to so so let me explain this before you guys hate on me. So they were uniform, they were all black. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I'm getting at this is because you're showing a common front, a common face that people can attach to, that you're you're creating an image, a brand, if you will. And I know that that sounds like capitalism, whatever, but it's it's an important part of imaging with and interfacing with the community. 
that would really help get leftism off the ground in communities and get people start to think about leftism differently because suddenly they would have these people in their lives helping them out that are their neighbors, their friends, etc. It is very important that we look at things from a branding perspective as well because the opposition does that. And the opposition is really good at twisting the things that we do, at turning things around. And by just participating in the community under a common banner, what we're doing, uh, we're showing a different face of leftism than what's given in the media to them. As we sign off here for tonight, uh, one last thing before we go, just the usual stuff there so that you guys can follow us on social media and whatnot. Our Twitter account is at Enceladus1 for the show. And my personal Twitter is at Kitsune Flame. And then Hems, uh, your Twitter? At Hems Fox. Yes. And we're also both on Mastodon. Uh, same handles. Just I'm on at Mastodon Social. He's on Snouts Online. We also do have a Patreon account. So if you like our show and want to follow us on Patreon, give us a few bucks. We would definitely appreciate that. The money will go back into helping produce the show. But also, one of the goals for the Patreon account, if we do get uh, a lot of money rolling in, is I want to create an activist network uh, using things like Nextcloud, Collabra Office Suites, uh, and, and other secure software as an alternative to using Google. And the thing is, is to do it on a larger scale like that takes a little bit of money, especially to make it affordable for people that might not have the means to pay for such a service. And also, of course, to have everything audited so that we know everything is, is secure. And I would really like to get that launched off the ground sometime later this year if uh, you want us to help out with that or if you just want to help us out with the show donate a few bucks to our Patreon and we would really appreciate that and of course uh, we'll always uh, say your name uh, we do got one sponsor so far Dark Moon Paul uh, so he's still on board with us thank you uh, we really appreciate that uh, we appreciate all of our listeners here so good night and solidarity good night <laughs>